Hello and welcome to EGM 702, Week 3, Part 5, Image Transformation. In EGM 713 and in the previous lectures of this class, we've normally thought about images as being RGB composites. That is, the color that we see is made up of a red component, a green component, and a blue component. This is not the only color system that we can use, though. Another way is known as Intensity, Hue, and Saturation, or IHS, also known as Hue, Saturation, and Lightness. Rather than choosing red, green, and blue components, it breaks a color value down as follows. The Hue component is the dominant wavelength, or what we would recognize as the color of the pixel, and it's usually given as a value ranging from 0 to 360 degrees. As you can see here, the color changes as we move around the color wheel. Saturation refers to how much white is mixed in with the color. As we move out from the center of the color wheel, we increase the saturation. And finally, we have intensity or lightness. That is how bright the pixel appears, ranging from a value of zero, meaning totally dark or black, and one or 100, representing totally light or white. One application that we can use for the IHS transformation is something called IHS Fusion. With this, we use high-resolution panchromatic data to sharpen or increase the resolution of the multispectral data. The way that we proceed is as follows. First, we resample the multispectral data to have the same spatial resolution as the panchromatic data. This doesn't actually increase the spatial resolution, it just changes the pixel size. Next, we transform the multispectral RGB image to an IHS image. So we have the intensity component shown here. After we have that, we swap out the low resolution intensity component for the high resolution panchromatic image. As shown here, we're using a spot 10 meter image to sharpen a 30 meter Landsat image. Finally, we transform the swapped IHS image back to RGB, and you can see how the new RGB image appears here, much sharper, and we can see a lot more detail in the image. Now this is because a lot of the detail that we see in an image actually comes from variations in the brightness, and we can get by with a lot less detail for the actual color of the different pixels. One thing that you might notice looking at this graph is that a lot of neighboring bands are correlated. That is, many surfaces or objects have similar reflectances in nearby wavelengths. What this means is that we often have a lot of redundant information in different bands. This can make distinguishing different surfaces more difficult as they tend to look quite similar. For example, snow and clouds are quite similar in a number of wavelengths. Distinguishing between different kinds of vegetation can be quite hard as color differences can be very subtle. To try and get around this, we have some techniques that we can use to help maximize the differences between bands, which makes it easier to extract information from the image. As an example, I have an image here showing two different Landsat bands. The visible blue band is on top, and the visible green band is on bottom. The plot here is a scatter plot of the pixel values for each of these bands. The value in the green band is on the x-axis, and the value in the blue band is on the y-axis. You can see that most of the values fall pretty close to this one-to-one -one line here. What this means is, most of the variation that we see in the image depends upon how far along this line we are. We're not necessarily gaining any extra information by having both bands. The principal component transformation looks to take advantage of this fact. We start by essentially finding the line that best fits the data. Again, basically boiling down the most important information in the image, which we call the first principal component. After that, we can calculate the second principal component perpendicular to this line. And we might want to shift the axis slightly so that the minimum value along the second principal component is zero. Because of the way that we have constructed this, these two bands are completely uncorrelated we've maximized the differences between the two bands so that we also don't have any redundancy in the image. This is a little bit of a toy example. Normally we do this with all of the bands or a number of bands from a multispectral image, 
but this process is a little bit harder to visualize. When we do a principal component transformation or decomposition on our original image, this is the result. For Landsat data, as we're using here, the first principal component, PC1, consists mostly of information from the near and short wave infrared bands. Principal component 2 consists mostly of information from the visible bands. You can see this because the water appears significantly brighter in PC2 than it does in PC1. PC3 comes mostly from the near infrared. You can see that the vegetation in the image appears brighter than the water. That's one example of how you can tell. As we go further down the principal components, we have less variation and less information. Most of the variants are the information in the original six band image, which is three visible bands, a near infrared band, and two short wave infrared bands, is contained within the first three or four bands. After that, we add less and less information with each additional band. We can combine the first three principal components to create something called a decorrelation stretch, shown here on the right. The image on the left is the original true color composite. The decorrelation stretch is a way to increase the distribution of color within an image while preserving the relative characteristics of the original image. And what we can see here is most of the vegetation surfaces are a very bright magenta color, indicating that their highest values are in principal component one. Water appears bright green, indicating that water surfaces have a significantly higher value in PC2, principal component two, than in the other bands. Most of the rest of the image appears to be shades of red or orange or green with, very, with some very small regions of dark blue. I'll post larger versions of these images on Blackboard, and if you like, you can have a look at them and see if you can't figure out what these blue areas and what other areas might represent. One application of principal component analysis that we'll discuss here is called Feature-Oriented Principal Component Selection, or FPCS. And this is a technique that is used to do geologic mapping because it helps to uh, sort of remove the signal from a lot of the um, terrain that is not related to something that we're interested in, like different mineral uh, types or different uh, chemical signatures. And so the way that this works is we start with the known target signatures. So whatever it is that we're looking for, if it's a mineral, if it's a different chemical signature, we need to know what the spectral signature of that surface or of that target is. We then do a principal component transformation on our satellite images and we examine that to determine the relative contribution to each principal component of the original satellite bands. And if we take the known target signatures for what it is that we're looking for and the information about the relative contributions to each principal component from each of the original satellite bands, then we can select and interpret our principal components in order to tell in order to map or to identify the target signatures that we're looking for. An example here from a paper by Krosta et al. in 2003 was looking at mapping different mineral types in Argentina using aster imagery. And using a subset of aster bands, so bands 1, 4, 6, and 7, they performed a principal component transformation on that set of four bands. And here are the relative contributions to each of those principal components of each of the original bands. You see for principal component 4, we have a positive contribution from band 6 and band 7, and a negative contribution from bands 4 and band 1. Now, for the mineral kaolinite, we know that in aster band 4, it has a high reflectance. In aster band 7, it has a high reflectance. And in aster band 1, it has a low reflectance. And in aster band 6, it has a low reflectance. So combining all of that information, as well as the relative contributions from each of the different bands to principal component four, 
we can tell that kaolinite is going to have a low value in principal component 4. So if we take the opposite of principal component 4, we should see bright values representing high abundance of kaolinite, dark values representing little to no abundance of kaolinite. And if we put all of this together for our different uh, minerals, or the authors put this together for the different minerals that they're looking for in this paper, we see that red values in this map represent high abundance of mostly kaolinite, blue values represent mostly alanite, green values represent mostly illite, and then we have different mixtures depending on the relative abundances of each of these different minerals. And then gray areas where we have very little, infra, or where there's very little abundance um, from these different minerals present. To sum all of this up, by transforming an image or transforming image data, we can make more use of the information in the image. For example, we can use it to sharpen multispectral images, increasing the resolution and our ability to see different features. We can also use it to improve the spectral differences between different surface types. And we can even interpret the different principal components for different applications depending on our prior knowledge. I've included a number of additional resources here. Uh, you can read more about this in Lilith and Kiefer and Chipman, Chapter 7, uh, Template All, Chapter 5.4, and Jensen, Chapter 8. And on Blackboard, I've also included a link to this paper by Krosta et al. that looks at doing principal component uh, analysis for geologic mapping. And there's a link to a video that discusses HSL color space in a little bit more detail. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any questions, please post them in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.